Coming up on Influencing Entrepreneurs. Like your first few investors, they can see the product, they can see it, but it's really like they're just investing in you. And like there's been times over the last year alone where if we didn't get this investment, like it would have just been a little bit more difficult. After years of teaching entrepreneurship and consulting with numerous companies, I realized that when business leaders shared stories of their success, hardships, and mistakes, it always had an impact in the classroom. So I thought, why not share these real-life business cases for education and inspiration? I'm Kazmer Ward, and this is Influencing Entrepreneurs. On today's episode, we speak with Desmond Wiggins. Desmond graduated from Winston-Salem State University with a degree in business management. He then traveled to China, where he studied international business during his MBA program. During this time, he was able to immerse himself in the tech space, working on many advanced tech cross-border projects. Upon graduation, he came back to the U.S. to start Battery Exchange, a startup company developing a rental platform and mobile app that provides a more convenient and efficient way for cell phone users to charge their batteries while on the go. Two of Desmond's goals are to change the narrative of African Americans in the tech space globally and domestically and build a lasting legacy for his family. Thank you for being here today, Desmond. Yeah. I want to ask, you were out with your friends, having a good time out in the city, you ran into a problem. What happened? About a year and a half ago, I'm actually in uh, mainland China because I was doing an MBA program and I was out there for two years. Um, we're about an hour away from our campus and I'm with my now co-founder and like a bunch of friends. And his cell phone is dead, mine is at 5%. Our friends wanted to go to another location, but we couldn't because our lifeline, you know, was in essence about to die. And so, and your lifeline is your battery. Exactly, like, your cell phone, your phone. Right? It's what kind of keeps me connected to my my wife, my uh, my family. You know, social media because we're out with some friends that we haven't seen in a while. So you know, we we're going to capture every moment. Um, and then, yeah, we just started to challenge and say, like, why isn't there a more convenient way for us to move around while charging our phone if we don't have a charger? So you found a solution to that that extended your lifeline. What was that? Yeah, so it was a um, stationary um, charger. And we said, like, this is cool, but why can't we move around? And so in essence, um, literally that night, um, we went back to our dorm and stayed up for a few hours just going through some different um, models, sketching some things out, and then in essence came up with what we have now. Well, I want to hear about this product. So what you're saying is instead of just being stuck at one bar or one restaurant for an hour while you're plugged into the wall, if you happen to have brought your charger, you wanted to take the wall with you. Pretty much. So what did, the, what did this create? It, it created what we have now. So uh, the concept is called Battery Exchange and pretty much provide portable batteries for individuals to rent. Um, yeah, and it comes compatible with each and every cell phone on the market right now. So iOS, you know, Android devices, Google devices, um, and pretty much those would be stationed in a kiosk machine. So you think about retail and business locations. So your bars, your restaurants, your convention centers, anywhere um, just outside of your home, right? And then you literally find one of those through the application, scan a QR code, pay a dollar up front, and then each minute after, it's 10 cents. So about 30 minutes, um, that's been our average user. You get about from like 10% to about 70, 75%. It's like four bucks to allow you to continue your evening, you know, some people use it for five minutes just to call Uber or whatever it may be. So we never want people to be, you know, disconnected from the things that are important to them, which is, again, all through your cell phone. So you developed this product. Now, portable chargers, I, I'd love to give you credit that you actually created the portable charger, but they were already out there. Yep. So you come up with a solution, but let's be honest, you, you didn't invent the portable charger. How do you realize there's an opportunity to make money off of portable chargers? I mean, you start looking at the research, right? You think about how many people, I'll take for example, there's over 300 million cell phone users in the US alone, right? And then we started to dig in deeper how many people were actually potentially running into our situation. And we found out that 80% of those cell phone users never carried a spare charger with them. So I thought about what we did when we didn't have a spare charger. We either haggle a friend or like a bartender, um, if you do have a charger, you're fighting over an outlet or you're having to hover or the worst part is like you're disconnected from your phone and like every minute you're like looking. And so 
or the last thing is like doing without like you know how many times that I've literally just said man I'm just gonna have my cell phone de dead and like again it's that anxiety and that fear like low battery anxiety is actually a thing and so we started to see that there was a lot of people that in essence would you know love a solution there just wasn't a thing out there and so in essence a lot of people nowadays within the sharing economy they pay for convenience so in essence we felt if we were able to come together and place a model to where individuals can have this accessible to them then in essence it could be something that we could actually make money off of so that's kind of how we came up from you know not originating the portable battery but finding a solution within that space well you're not really selling the portable battery and we're going to get to that in yeah. a minute how do you identify the portable battery hardware that's going to fit your model? Well, so in essence, um, I was fortunate enough. So while doing my MBA program, I got very heavy in the tech space on a global market. So I was helping a lot of um, later stage uh, technology companies in America make that transition out to Asia, um, to Europe. And so that gave me a lot of access to manufacturing partners. And so in essence, I was able to build, um, we call it guanxi, like network and relationship with uh, various manufacturers. So I just started testing out and kind of gave them some sketches as far as like what we wanted. And um, we finally found um, a manufacturing partner that just kind of worked with what we wanted, um, even like our future iterations and what we were wanting to do. And so in essence, we built that relationship and then ended up um, signing an exclusivity. So we're pretty much the only company in the entire United States that can work with this company. And it's um, a pretty reputable company. It can in essence give us a few product or a couple of thousand really so it just kind of made sense for where we were trying to scale to within your technology there's there's nothing worse in our relationship than when an apple user an iphone user needs a charger and their friend is an android user yep so your your product solves that pretty much it has it for for the majority of phones that are in there how do you start getting these into the hands of users you have to put it in the atmospheres where they run into that inconvenience the most. So for us, um, our first vertical was the bar and restaurant space. We did, literally, we piloted um, over a bunch of events, right? Anything from like networking events, um, conventions, bar crawls. Um, and then we started to see where are the spaces that they, again, run into this inconvenience. And so the convention center space um, just kind of made sense. You think about it, um, we're, again, like into the data, they see about 20,000 people um, that stay there for, you know, over seven hours. You know, these individuals are, again, capturing the moments. They're taking down notes. They're doing work. They're sending emails. They're, you know, talking to their loved ones. But, you know, in essence, they run into this inconvenience. A lot of times of what we saw, as far as like the user behavior, midday. And so that's kind of when they were looking for solutions. And it's either like, should I go get some food, charge my phone? And it was all these different decisions that they have to make. And we just, in essence, wanted to make life easy. That, like literally, that's what we want to do, make life easier for any individual. So those are some of the spaces. You think about um, a game. You, are you a Panthers fan? Yes. Not sure. Yeah. So in essence, you go to a Panthers game and again, capturing these moments and being there for a long time. And a lot of individuals want to extend their night, whether it's like going to a bar or going out with some friends afterwards. And we don't want them to be limited um, for, you know, the fun and the engagement that, that they want to kind of be involved in. You, you build the technology, the hardware for it, but that really is the scooter. Yeah. We see the, yep, the, yep. the flip scooters out there. Once you've identified the hardware, and we're gonna call the hardware your scooter, how do you get to where you're collecting payment mm, yeah. and tracking inventory? Yeah, so pretty much um, built up a team of um, some developers. Um, some offshore and I've actually brought on like a senior lead. Um, he's super experienced and we've pretty much been cultivating that process right now. So kind of wanted to be hands off with the payment. So we just leverage Stripe. Again, there's models out there and you just kind of leverage that. Um, and then we use AWS for data collection and our database. So it, it's, it's, it's not as difficult. You just have to have the, the right amount of people and the right amount of expertise in order to make it happen. So. We've been pretty much doing that for the last few months and we're looking to launch the, the app within the next month, month, month or two. 
my concern would be, my, mm -hmm. this is my concern yeah, for, for sure. the scooters. I hear it all the time. So. Yeah. yeah. Is uh, are people returning those scooters. Oh, okay. So this is much easier to put in my pocket and do whatever with. Yeah. How are you controlling that? Um, a little bit different than Redbox, but when you create an account, in essence, that's the only way you can access a battery. And your credit card information is assessed to that. So you pretty much have like up to a day to return the battery back before you get a late fee. Um, but before then, in essence, we're, you know, sending you a notification just saying like, hey, you know, I'm pretty sure your battery is charged now. It might be time to return it. And we'll identify a, um, a nearby kiosk machine for you. Like we try to give you all the convenience in the world to, in essence, be able to return the battery for the next person. Because again, it's within a sharing economy. So as at this point, nobody really keeps it. It's for the other individual when they're in the need to potentially use the battery. What happens, what are some of the uh-oh moments that you're like, ooh, I, I didn't think they, that our users would do this? I think that one of the things that we're looking to do with our next release in the convention center space is kind of a tutorial of actually how to use the battery. Um, like there's such a big human component in it right now to where we're actually like at the events, but we're asking the users to see what the opportunities are. Some people don't understand that all you do is like flick the uh, lever down and then you plug it into your phone. So I think the education um, we thought was gonna be a little bit easier. So we pretty much have this like six foot machine and it has like a 43 inch digital screen uh, for branding and advertisement. So we're gonna use that as like an education platform. So when it's your, t your first time coming to the kiosk machine, you in essence will know how to use the battery. So it's, it's a little small things like that. Where is your market focused right now? How many of these are out on the street? We've pretty much been piloting since February, right? And so we've been in Charlotte, um, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, um, Raleigh-Durham. We went down to Atlanta, did a big event, like 3,000 people. Um, we've been up to DC as well. So we're right now focused in the North Carolina market, the convention center space, using that as an anchor and then the surrounding locations around it to really prove out the business model to where you can leave one location and drop it off to another. So in essence, um, the mom and pop uh, fr and some franchises as well, we look to get involved with them. But it's like the downtown areas of major metropolitan um, cities. Now, do you have the automation down at this point to where, let's just say you had two machines. Could I charge my battery at the convention center and then return it at the transportation center? Not yet. And, and so like we're looking at early Q1 to launch that actual initiative. So right now we're just pretty much beta testing. And a lot of this pilot is in essence going to allow us to know where the other machines need to be because we do see that as a, you know, uh, a, a true traction as far as like individuals taking the light rail to get to the convention center and then vice versa. So those are some of the learning things that will start to look into over the next few months, but um, yeah. How are you facilitating the, the payments and all of that without the machines right now? We went to the users and just went off of what they use, right? So our target audience has been a lot of um, young professionals. Um, so we're in those environments. Um, so we leverage Cash App, um, we le leverage um, you know PayPal and the Stripe um, credit card reader. So we just kind of leverage that because again, we're, we're at the events with them. So right now there are, instead of there being a machine, I would see you or, or one. Well, of there's them. a machine there too, but in right. essence, we can have the conversation because a lot of it is customer discovery, right. right? So we're still going through that process, but we do have payment platforms that we just leverage. Again, like right. third party, um, until we move into the application phase to where everything will be through Stripe. Which the app goes right with the machine and, yep. the, and the hardware. Yep. So that's the biggest challenge is that's expensive. What phase are you in now to make sure that there's 10,000 battery exchange machines across the nation? That's the goal. We pray for that. But, um, <laughs> you know, that's where we want to get to. Um, you know, obviously being a startup, we bootstrap. So we bootstrap to get a few prototype models, kind of put it out there, um, partner with some events, um, got that revenue in as well. We've won a few pitch competitions around the region, um, been a part of a few accelerator programs that have opened up the doors for some um, angel investors that kind of came in the mix, but we still needed more. So we actually just launched a crowdfunding campaign. And um, the reason why we did that is because, um, in essence, we, we started really diving into the investment uh, and I call it a game because you really have to understand the dynamics. And so for us, um, like initially our minimum investment was like 15K. 
And so we started to look at the, our supporters and our network and our community and some of those individuals didn't fit that mold of that minimum investment and they weren't, you know, an accredited investor, right? Somebody that's making 250K um, a, a mill in like assets, right? And right. so we wanted to really open up the opportunity for our true supporters, like individuals that like were just rooting us on to become investors in our company. So what we recently did was that crowdfunding campaign to really open up that door for people that really want to get involved and um, that's that's been a phenomenal. It's it's actually becoming bigger than just the just the product. Like we're educating people on, you know, some people didn't even know like that they could investment invest in the tech space, right? Or what vesting schedules were, what convertible notes were, and like just various elements like that. So my biggest thing is, even if I educate somebody right now and they don't invest in my company, now they're just a little bit more aware, right? So when the next opportunity comes about, they can potentially jump into it. So. Where could people right now find your crowdfunding campaign? Yeah, so we're on localstake.com uh, on backslash battery exchange. Um, it's an X and then change. Um, so yeah, right there. Um, we've been to an amazing start. Like our first few weeks um, have been amazing. Like again, some of the support that we've gotten has been like authentic and like people just like, hey, I've been waiting for you guys to open up this opportunity. We really do a good job on the social aspect. So like our, you know, Instagram, Facebook, again, cause our target audience like really loves that, that side. Um, they've been seeing us grow over the past few months and they love it. And so in essence, when we went to this crowdfund, it was easy for them to say like, I've already seen these guys and girl, you know, foster this company and build it up and connect with people. and. You know, we have testimonials of individuals that actually use the product and they love it. Like for us, it's just like, how do we get to 10,000, right? Like that's how, how, but this is the immediate, um, this is the beginning stage of that. So for this initial capital raise, what is your what is your first round look like? What, yeah. what is your cap that you're trying to raise? So we're raising about 300K. 300,000. Um, and that, in essence, allows us to um, finish everything on the software side, um, have enough hardware for, um, so we pretty much have like five uh, regional convention centers that are kind of reaching out to us. Like they actually approached us wanting, you know, to in essence be a part of, you know, our solution because for them, they're always looking at extra amenities, right? They're always looking at ways to keep their attendees, you know, there longer, add some extra convenience. And so it just kind of made sense for that model. So we want to be able to have enough product to be able to supply those. And then again, the surrounding locations and then, you know, bootstrapping, um, you know, bring some uh, senior individuals on the team as well. So we have a pretty good advisory core. Um, and that's been super phenomenal in allowing us to really start getting a foundation and you know, some funnels that can be duplicated in order for us to be, you know, more efficient as we go to market. So after you do the first raise, that'll get you a good set of what your infrastructure should yeah. look like. Pending that success. When we speak optimist. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. But, but I, I, when that succeeds, mm -hmm. the next raise is quite substantial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're looking at, you know, raising like a couple million because we're actually in the talks with a few um, potential strategic partners. Um, and I think that's gonna be a huge way for our growth. Um, you know, you think about like scaling across the nation, like having the right strategic partner that can get you in the right environment. So that's kind of what we're looking into now. And obviously you just gotta have enough capital to supply those um, high demands in the future. So yeah, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be pretty hefty, but this is a great, um, you know, start to where we wanna be. And I think that people will be able to see that we are able to manage, you know, these different raises. So I think like within the next, you know, eight months, you could definitely start to see um, us going to those higher uh, capital raises. We talked to a lot of entrepreneurs throughout the, the, the years. Everyone from, they've on their third, fourth, fifth exit to where you're burning the candle at both ends just to, to make this work. Are you, is this your full-time job as of right now? Yeah, it's, it's been full time for about a year and a half now. And so in essence, I was in the corporate world. Um, and while I was there, I was dabbling in entrepreneurship. I started a few companies. One was like a fintech and then one was like a logistical company and then tried to start this um, retail company. And the only reason why they didn't push forward is because I didn't have the time to really invest in it. So 
um, what I guess it's four four years now. I decided to leave the corporate environment, even though I learned so much and it was amazing, um, and go off to China. You know, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to get my MBA, and I really wanted to get exposed to some advanced technology. So in essence, I've been full time ever since then. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a journey. Um, I love it. Um, it, it literally wakes me up every single day. Um, sometimes three o'clock in the morning, you know, that's some of my best ideas or like just really getting prepared for a big pitch competition or investment conversation. So yeah, I, I really love the game. I, I think you have to love it in order to be at this state to really push through. So I, I had mentioned we, we, we speak with entrepreneurs all the way from those that are on their third or fourth exit. You're right now in the middle of raising your first round of, of, of real capital to get going. Um, what are some of the challenges of not having a the other corporate full-time job you have and kind of piecing things together for a startup? Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest things, and it just comes from, I guess, wherever you're at on the co-founder side, um, like we in essence have six other people that work with us that are fully invested in this company just as much as us and in essence I would love to pay them right like they are literally I mean we have hardware expertise like software marketing operations and I think that's one of the biggest things and that's why I go so hard so that I can get enough money to in essence help those individuals because they have put in a lot of time um, I think about that and you know, even when we're having these investment conversations, um, you, a lot of times some people see us and they're just like, oh, early stage. And it's just like they write you off. And it's just like, no, but I like have a tangible product. Like if I had enough capital, literally all, a lot of problems would be solved. And I, I know that's the story, but like, you know, when you have right. the proof and you, you could kind of show it, um, it's kind of difficult to kind of have those conversations. And then, but that's just like you hear a hundred no's and you get one yes, but that's the yes that you need. Right. Um, so those are some of the difficulties. And then just in essence, and I think that's something that we just now figured out with our advisory team is having more senior or tenured individuals to come in and, you know, build out some processes um, to make sure, again, like making sure things were, you know, efficient and operational and really thinking about two years from now versus like the demands of right now. So I think like I've had to make that switch of just like, where do we want to be two years from now? You know, what does that look like? So it, it just comes with the process in itself. What are some of your biggest challenges of raising capital right now? I, I think I go back to the narrative of it's just not, um, like again, the support and just like my community. Um, I don't have a granddad that could just write me a, a hundred thousand dollar check to like solve all my problems. So I think, you know, the, the limited, um, you know, I guess not necessarily network because we do have a strong network, but capital within that network. Um, and then the individuals that do have capital, they're risk averse. So you think about they're just going to real estate and opportunities like that. So again, this company is bigger than me because one of the biggest things I want to do is change the narrative of African-Americans in the tech space, right? And you do that by educating individuals that are in the tech space or not in the tech space, have capital, don't have capital. So like everybody is kind of really cultivating this shift into this world that is going to be, you know, the, in essence, like uh, one thing that I always say is uh, the behaviors and lifestyles that we have within the next 10 or 12 years or, or 20 years is in essence being innovated and constructed right now. And it's just like, do you want to continue to just be a consumer of it or do you want to be the innovators? So like with that narrative, it's challenging people in various elements to, to get in the game of technology and figure out where you land. It's either I'm going to, you know, be a startup entrepreneur and figure out that space or I'm going to figure out, out what it is to code and like become a part of a team or if I have a little bit of capital right now, I could invest in these companies and or, you know, maybe I'm just going to start to save up to where that I can invest in this company. So I think just kind of figuring out those solutions is something that I'm just trying to, again, just rolling with the punches and figuring it out myself. Playing in the, in the tech space and trying to get rid of the stigma of the black community and tech, the tech space. 
when do you move on to your next venture? Because if this is your third, I'm sure once one or two rounds are funded, you'll be on to something else. Well, I mean, for us, um, I do think um, the way we're projecting right now will have enough attractiveness um, to potentially um, get acquired within a few years. So, um, I think what I'm really trying to do, and I think it came from my time in China, um, I really want to be a part of us as Americans really getting into this deep tech space. Um, like I go over there like pretty often um, and they have initiatives for like 2050, 2060 and they want to be the top tier of a lot of AI, machine learning, a lot of blockchain. There's initiatives curated and geared towards that. So like how could we do something similar here? And so like I'm really trying to get into that space. So I'm actually going to be taking some courses in the data science space. Um, just to kind of really immerse myself in there so that in essence my next company will be a little bit more deep tech for the most part. As far as the resources you've been able to secure to this date, which has had the biggest impact on your business? I mean, of course capital, right? The early investors that, that believe in us um, and I, I think we talk to a lot of people and it's in essence like your first few investors. They can see the product, they can see it, but it's really like they're just investing in you. And that, like, there's been times over the last year alone where if we didn't get this investment, like it would have just been a little bit more difficult. So, you know, I appreciate those individuals that have been able to give me, you know, that space. And then I think about, um, you know, all the accelerated programs that I've been through as well, like being able to be mentored by individuals that have done what I want to do in essence, right? Um, and being able to leverage those resources have been phenomenal. Um, I think about just all the ecosystems, you know, from City Startup Labs to, we just graduated from uh, Riot um, up in Raleigh, Durham, which is an IoT hardware accelerator program. Um, you know, Innovate Charlotte, like all these different, um, you know, realms. I, I just like immerse myself in there and try to learn, you know, the network, learn the ecosystem and see how I can either you know, give, right, and then also receive as well. What did you learn in those ecosystems that you didn't learn in business school? I think, like, just really seeing it hands-on, because business school teaches you a lot of corporate, um, like, structure as far as, like, finance and, like, all these economic things. But um, when you think about a startup, like, lease projections are based off of, like, a pie in the sky, right? And so being able to um, pivot quickly is something else that, like, we just kind of learn um, because you can't spend too much time on something if it's not going and so a lot of times in the corporate culture I see like people just like hey we're gonna make this work and they're not as innovative and you know adaptable so I think those um, are some of the things I learned and then in essence um, really fleshing through business modeling um, how important customer discovery is I know in uh, Venture Prize at UNCC like the running joke is like customer discovery never stops right it's always going like literally I probably do the same to you just kind of ask like you know what works for you when are you running into these inconveniences and di different things like that just to in essence make sure we have the right product out there for the, the end user more so. Well thank you so much for your time. Um, if anybody wants to find out more about your crowdfunding, they can go to www.batteryexchange.co. .co, yes sir. And uh, we'll make sure to look for you on your crowdfunding site, which is local stake um, backslash battery exchange. All right, we'll put those up us. on the screen, make Thank sure you. people find you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Yep. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash Nexogy Education or visit influencingentrepreneurs.com to catch up on previous episodes with Casimir Ward.